Hey guys, and welcome back to Australian Fitness Stories. So today we are going to be talking to my husband. So this is Tommy. So I have spoken about him in some previous podcasts. So he has had some pretty crazy medical things happen to him, but it really hasn't slowed him down in his own health and fitness. And I think that that is pretty incredible. So we're going to have a little bit of a chat with him. So It's definitely slowed me down. It slowed you down. It hasn't stopped you, though. It hasn't stopped me, but it's definitely, it's been some hurdles. Oh, it has God. been some hurdles. So Especially you, this last one. We'll run through the first one. So let's start from this. This actually happened before we met. So this was when you were 25? 25, yeah. I got... Um, so look up at the camera. Cryptococcal <laughs> meningitis. <laughs> it crippled me. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, um, it was pretty crazy. You know, I was 25. I was feeling invincible you know going to the gym six six days a week and being a carpenter too like active all day every day and i was i was pretty happy with how i was looking and then in november 2013 i'm not well, good with dates <laughs> anyway, so i just started to feel some pain like every time my feet had hit the ground my, my heels would hit the ground i'd feel this pain shoot across my shoulder blades um i thought it was i thought i'd put my back out mm. and i just tried tried chiropractors physios all this like and then i went to see this last chiropractor and he took an x-ray of my of my chest and back because he was like something's not right and then they found a mass on my lung and they're like you got to go to the hospital right now because i was by that point i was still at work <laughs> but i was like able to walk maybe 10 meters and then i'd like literally curl up on the ground throwing up just dizzy as dizzy as all hell all the time and um most normal people would have gone to the hospital before this point like i was trying to sort it out like i was i was going to gps and and specialists like i didn't think it was anything crazy and then yeah went into hospital on the 19th of december and they did a uh, biopsy they stuck a massive needle through my through my back into the lump and took a biopsy of it and yeah they were like yeah you've got the rarest one of the rarest forms of meningitis known and it's pretty severe like yeah the, the details they gave me were pretty scary but i was like eh, of course you are <laughs> feeling all right so did they work out that there was spurs on your brain before or after they did surgery it was definitely after they, they obviously they couldn't have any stuff in my brain until they found what it was in my lung and then they because they they've, they've seen these cases before so it starts in your lung you get it from so a lot of the people that get the cryptococcal meningitis strand they've got an immune deficiency uh immune yeah like an immune, immune, immune deficiency yeah, yeah immune deficiency disease so they were like freaking out. They, they didn't know what was going on with me. And yeah, I came back all good for that. It's just, I just had that super rare moment and they, they found that the one that started in my lung came from the spotted red gum tree. The what are pollen. the chances of that though? Like he literally breathed in some pollen from a tree. <laughs> and then it grew to be a, a massive size of a golf ball in my lung. It was hard as a rock and it was fungal. And then that transferred to my brain, which... Uh, gave me the meningitis and so meningitis is when the uh, cerebral spinal fluid which surrounds your brain and your spine basically it, well the type of meningitis I don't know everything about meningitis yeah. but the type I had the cerebral spinal fluid is usually thinner than water and your body produces 20 milliliters of it every hour and then it drains off 20 milliliters every hour that's the so it's just a cycle yeah it's just like tra- changing the oil in your car constantly yeah. right? so around your brain just keeps it all clean and it's thinner than water and there's a little port in the bottom of your skull that drains it down like your your throat or something like that. I'm not, I'm not an expert. <laughs> but, but yeah, it drains yeah, out through yeah. the drainage well, port. So when I, yeah. the, 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 the meningitis I had turned it from thinner than water to as thick as jelly and it's surrounding your brain and your spine and because it's, it's gone from thinner than water to as thick as jelly, it's, it's um, can't, drain, it can't drain off. So your body's still producing 20 milliliters every hour. But then it can't drain off, so you get this cranial pressure. And the way they test your cranial pressure, they put a lumbar puncture in, which is another big needle, and they get you to lay on the bed sideways, curl up into a ball, and you're not allowed to move. Kind of like an epidural. 
except for your needle. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I've got a, you know, it's, again, yeah. it's got to drain out that thick fluid. So, and they test your cranial pressure by putting a needle into your spine. And then they have these tubes which measure in centimeters of pressure. So, the pressure coming out of your spine through that needle will push the fluid up a certain amount up the tube. And 15 centimeters is, I think this is right. Gone. From memory. <laughs> yeah. The, the 15 centimeters is, is your usual like gauge and they, they somewhere between seven and seven and 12 is like normal. And then they had to put tube on top of tube on top of tube for mine. It was, it, um, the cranial pressure got that high that it set me blind for two or three weeks, crushed the, crushed the optic nerves onto the bottom of my skull. And they were, they were like, I'm not sure if I was going to get my vision back. Because you were, so had you, so you also obviously had to have surgery. So the lump in your lung, you had a partial lobectomy. So half of your lung Yeah, so that removed. was, that was. Beginning or end? No, that was 12, 12 months after my recovery. Oh, okay. So first, first, first operation I had was a lump, uh, a, 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 lumbar shunt? A BP, no, yes, a lumbar shunt. Yeah. Yeah. So a lumbar shunt was first. And they put that, so that's basically a shunt that they put in your spine to release pressure off your spine and they wrapped around the side into my abdomen. And drained. And drained the fluid off okay. my spine and my brain, which gave me instant relief. Cause before, before they did the shunts, I was in hospital for a few months there and I was having lumbar punctures daily to relieve the pressure because they, I was too weak in that to go into surgery. Were they painful? Have, like it's probably yeah, a stupid it's, question. It's, it's but... ridiculous. Like it's, it's honestly something you do, definitely do not look forward to every day because okay. you're like oh yes a big needle in my spine <laughs> uh, for, for 20 minutes while I drain fluid off it and you're not allowed to move otherwise you could paralyze you, yeah, well I don't know if you could paralyze but well, a needle and spine yeah, sounds pretty yeah that's definitely not good so I had to get strong enough because I had like it took a month to diagnose me so most people were dead by then and then I got diagnosed late and then I still managed to be one of the ones that made it through. Um, so you went back, what, 12 months later and they... I can't remember the exact time frames. Like, you know, I'm just sticking with the details. But, yeah, look, it's not a strong suit. <laughs> but so the first, one of the, one of the first surgeries was the lum, lumbar shunt, which I got put in my, my spine around my abdomen. And then I went home for, um, yeah, a couple, couple, couple of weeks and in those that time I thought it would be a great idea to just like I'm out of the hospital I've got my shunt in I'll go over to Morton for two weeks go over to Morton it's raining the whole time and it literally doesn't surprise me that you did that and, and while we were driving around the four by four tracks I had ruptured my shunt in my spine so by the time we were on the on the barge back I had a sack of fluid like you know half a half a half a mango sticking out of my spine because the fluid was just draining out of my spine, not going in the shunt and just creating a fluid sac on my spine. Mm. So then went, went back into hospital and then they took out the lumbar shunt and put in the VP shunt, which is... Which you still got. So it's yeah. like the, it's like a little bulge um, with the scar that sort of wraps around this way. And then this is the tube that runs all the way down into his stomach. So when we first met, he had the um, VP shunt. And I remember the whole time on our date, just looking at it, thinking that he had this really prominent neck vein because I did not know what it was. You don't normally whip these ones out on a first date, but when we competed together and he got really lean, you could actually see the tube run the whole way down and like across his stomach, which was pretty crazy. Mm. So yeah, VP shunt went in. And I can't remember, because I was like, I was in, in and out hospital for six months. And I can't remember at what point it was, but I like got over being in the hospital. So I was mm. like, can I go? Because I was just literally staying there to get medication through a pick line, which went in my bicep there and fed a line straight to my heart. So, because that pick, like a, a uh, IV line can only stay in for a couple of days. Yeah. Whereas pick line can stay in for three weeks. Or four weeks you know it's, it's a lot cleaner so I, was, I just got sent home with um this little box that i had to clip on every day to give myself some ibuterosin ibuterosin or something like that. i'm not sure yeah. <laughs> one of those 
drugs that antibiotics or something. No, no, I can't remember. It just it was supposed to kill the fungal infection. Oh, okay. So it was pretty crazy stuff, but it didn't make me feel great. But I was I was like, I'm not gonna have this hospital, so I want to go home. Mm. Went home and uh, I don't know if I instantly regretted, but my partner at the time definitely instantly regretted it because I was just hard work. You know, yeah. I barely. It is hard looking after someone though. Well, I could barely like I'd f constantly because we had tiles. Like I'd constantly fall over. Like I was like a decrepit old man. Like get up <laughs> off the couch and just like fall over. And then, oh, and then she'd be like, "Just go back to the hospital." I'm like, "I don't want to be there." But then you I'm don't going, like the hospital. I ended up going back there. Yeah. Just I just needed that break, you know. And then yeah, after once I once I got out of hospital, it took another six months to recover to a point where I could go back to work. When's your surgery in amongst this? So had the first six months, like got admitted on the 19th of December. Yeah. It was six months in and out of the hospital yeah. to get to a point. And then um, I had six months of recovery after that. So just even like, cause I, I ended up moving, like breaking up with the, the ex and then moved in with my Obviously, brother. Obviously, but. <laughs> yeah, but moved in with my brother who was great. Like he just said, roof over your head, food on the table, yeah, that's bedroom, really... like, and then as long as it takes you, it takes you. And I was, I was not the best housemate because I was, you know, I was young and I was not in the best headspace. So I was a bit of a grub, but he put up with me and very grateful for that. Then mm. six months of, two, it was at the point where like I'd, I'd sit down on the, on the ground in front of the TV and then to get up, was anxiety because I was that weak to just even get up off the ground, push up off the couch. Like I'd have to psych myself up for 20 minutes to be able to do that. But then you just, you push through it and you, you get to the point and then, yeah, just start, start bit by bit going back, you know, a few days a week here and there. Was there a part of you that just sort of thought, why do I even bother? Never. Never? Never. I, that was my first, that was my first big medical thing. So I was like, I got this. But you know? some people only take one and they throw in the towel because yeah. it would be <clears throat> mentally challenging when things that used to be so easy to you are suddenly so hard. I've never been one to just like think that there's no end to it. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can you can definitely be at a point where you're like, I hope this ends soon or I hope I hope I get over this mound soon or whatever, but you never, you know, this last this last bout, which we'll get to later, has been the I mean, probably because it's the most recent too. It's the most easily embedded. You know, you, you, you get through these things and you remember the good stuff and you delete the bad stuff, you know. Yeah, I suppose. Because it's no point in holding on to the bad shit. You you might as well just pick pick the things that'll help you get through stuff rather than the stuff that's gonna beat you down, you know. Because I could easily I suppose I could have easily just highlighted all the bad bits and then be like, oh, I've got to go through this again, you know. You could have ended up really bitter, I feel. I, I feel like things like that can make you really bitter. I think as, as, as my life goes on and I go through more of these things, I'm getting bitter. And bitter. I don't know if that's, look, I feel like older, as we get older, that's happening to everyone a little bit. Yeah. But So in amongst there also had half your lung taken out. So there's actually a picture on his Instagram. <laughs> Get your so when we he he got the surgeon to take a photo of the bit of lung that they actually took out which also to be honest doesn't surprise me um so he has that on his instagram feed so he also uh showed me that on one of our sort of beginning dates um but he was pretty lucky when they did do the surgery they went in through his back rather than completely opening up your chest right so the recovery was a lot better yeah so, so here's the the lung that got taken out. But look, you can still blow up balloons and like lung capacities. Like it's filled back out in its cavity and it's, yeah. it's pretty good now. It is. So that was, yeah, when you were 25. So how long? 26. 26? I, it was at least a year after like I had to get my strength. And like they, they gave me these drugs to kill it and they kept testing my blood to make sure that there was, mm. you know, the, well, you were markers, still getting blood tests the, when we, yeah, we the, met. the markers were there, but they weren't elevated, so they knew that it was dead or dormant. Dormant, yeah. yeah. So once I recovered, was back at work, they say, so like, you know, you just get back on your feet, you just get back to work, and then 
you got to go in to get half your lung taken out. You're like, and there's another, I can't remember what the recovery was for that, but it wasn't too bad. It was maybe a, like couple, a couple of months. Yeah, about that. Yeah, okay. Like, I think I, I think I was going back and just site supervising okay. for a bit there. Because it and would then, be hard then, having a physical and, job. And then, well, then I was at site, so I could test myself every day, you know, like find something to do. And then if I, if it was too much for me, there was always other guys there that could mm. do it, you know, but I was just constantly one foot in front of the other every day, just having a, having a crack and trying to get back to normality. What was your headspace like during all that? Very positive. I'm more, I'm, you know, I was, I was a very, very, very positive person for a, first 30 years of my life <laughs> until you met me <laughs> uh, it's definitely i'm definitely more positive now but it's it's different kind of positivity you know you, you're you're a bit more awake to so when you go through your first traumatic thing you're like okay this is new like and, and it's all a new experience and you don't know what's coming you don't know how long the recovery is going to take you don't know what sort of hurdles you're going to face but then once you've been through it once and then again and then again and then you just start to know what to expect. So you get, you know, you know you can make it through it, but you're definitely not as perky going through it because you're like, fuck, I'm just going to head down, go through this, do it my way. And then, you know, you'll come out the other side, but you're definitely not like when I, when I had my meningitis, you know, I had people coming up to the hospital regularly to try to keep my spirits high. Whereas now I don't think I'd need to, I just need you. That's it. But it's, because, you know, not your first radio, now. yeah. Like, I, you know, everybody who knows me, they're like, Thomas is back in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, um, yeah, it's definitely an iron, huh? that's for sure. So, how long do you think it was until you were back in the gym normally? Um, like back to full speed. Yeah. I don't think I ever got back to I what you were before. Well, I was an animal, like, uh, until I was 25, like, you know, you know, you, you come out, you, you're in your <laughs> teens to your, to, to, to your mid-20s, you're just like, you know, gym is life and that sort of thing, whereas after something like that, you sort of get different priorities, and yeah. I, I got back into it, and I, I, I competed after the lung came out, mm. so, which was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cold <laughs> prep wasn't what really for you. Hey, you got to, uh, I've, I've ticked it off, I've experienced yeah, it, you know? like, I didn't want to. I just wanted because when I when I got out of the after the VP shunt and the and the low back to me and that they were like just take it easy you you got a VP shunt in your head like you don't want to be pushing too hard or whatever and and you just you just work out your limits which hmm. my limits didn't change it's just I just had to work back up to them okay um yeah. That was sort of uh, the first rodeo. And I suppose the second one was while we were together about three years ago. Yes, a little bit over three years ago yeah, now. Yeah. Did you want to run through what happened there? Okay. All right. Well, I can say it from my side, I suppose. So I was visiting a friend and then I got a text message. I'm pretty sure it was a text message. No, no told you told me. me. I definitely didn't text you <laughs> from being inside of a bobcat. Oh, here we go. I was like, all right. <laughs> called me and said I've shattered my foot and he sounded really panicked and then he said like where are you and he'd hung up on me by then and then he wasn't answering but our phones are linked so I can map him so I just mapped to his location and just drove there and rocked up at the job site and you really uncrust yourself by that point yeah. so he did look I don't know a lot about machinery but bobcats are the ones that scoop the dirt. So he was on a bobcat, scooped the dirt, and then the bobcat has tipped boards and all of the safety features on this bobcat failed. The people that owned it had added in some extra stupid bar in the bobcat that shouldn't even have been there that when the boom dropped down, yeah. crushed his foot in it sideways like a little sandwich. Yeah, it was not pleasant. And then he's had to operate. So it's all foot pedals. So he's then had to, with his other foot, operate the foot pedals, uncrush himself and get his foot back out. So when I rocked up, you weren't in the bobcat anymore. No, you were sitting in, in the, the car and you still had your sock on, but his foot was like, it was very swollen. And I've, I've watched this one 
drain fluid out of his knees with like a syringe and cut himself open a million times and doesn't blink an eye. But I could tell that he was in a lot of pain from this one. So I was freaking out a little bit because I hadn't seen him in this much pain before. And we'd already called an ambulance and we were waiting and it ended up like we were waiting ages. So I ended up calling the ambulance as well, but obviously they can't provide ETAs to the public just in case ambulances have got to be re-diverted. They don't want to promise you five minutes and then it ends up being longer. So they don't really tell you. But we ended up waiting about an hour and a half for the ambulance because I was debating just throwing him in my car and driving to emergency myself. But the ambulance rocked up, jacked you full of the green whistle. Yeah. And then took him into the hospital. Um, I thought I was going to be out the next day. I thought they were going to cast me up and send me so on did, my way. Well, I was expecting that maybe you'd have to have some screws put in. Yeah. Or something. Like it was what I was sort of thinking. Yeah. I wasn't expecting him to have crushed all of the arteries in his foot, which was the main issue. Yeah, circulation. Is that because he'd crushed all of the arteries, he stopped getting blood supply to a lot of his foot. So his big toe copped at the worst. So it, we had to wait three weeks. It was, it was around three weeks for the big toe to die. For the, so the doctors had said that they wanted to wait to see how much of his foot died because they didn't want to just go in gung-ho and amputate too much. So they wanted to see how much of his foot would die on its own and declare itself. So by the end of the three weeks, his big toe was black. And you could tap it and it was hard like a rock. And I've got this video when I had my acrylics like tapping his toe and it sounds like you're tapping on a glass window. It was pretty crazy. It was weird. Because the, um, the first big problem when we got in was compartment syndrome. Yes. Well, so, you got that too. So that was like the first big, like the, forget about the, the toe amputation, like the compartment syndrome because mm. my foot got crushed. So got crushed sideways down to 30 millimeters so you can imagine your whole foot just having a bar so on the side a bar a, a plate across the back here and then a bar just crushing it down to 30 millimeters so my toe was my foot was like a banana <laughs> and and I, you were wearing steel caps I, but I steel caps, steel caps weren't going to save you it was banana. just one of those little tiny bobcats with the hand steering and the foot pedal controls and when it when it went forward i put my foot up to brace myself so i didn't get Jump mm. into the thing. And then my foot slipped out and my other foot went onto the pedal that controlled the boom, which started bringing the boom down. I've got the machines forward, so I'm trying to get my leg back in. It was going to hit me halfway down my shin, but I ended up getting it back in, so I just grabbed my foot. And then I just I wonder, I think I've got a photo of when that um when he first went into the hospital and how swollen and bruised your foot was. Let me have a look. Oh, here we go. No. Oh no, that one's all after the surgeries. <coughs> so we ended up having 16 surgeries. I think it was 16 surgeries over six weeks. So they were gradually amputating bits and pieces and doing debris debridements. 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 Yeah, yeah okay. they were doing like it got to the point where they were literally having to take dead flesh off every couple of hours so they couldn't take take me into surgery every couple of hours so they were they were doing debridements while i was awake so i'm sitting, sitting laying in bed and they'd give me the happy gas which does nothing for pain it's just distract yeah it's just distract you a little bit like you just get a funny voice and whatever <laughs> but they were like peeling these bandages off every couple of hours and it's everything stick in and it's like so tender. it was pretty full on for anyone that's got a weak stomach look away i'll tell you when to look back but i'll show you guys a little bit of a video so you can sort of fathom what we were dealing with so this was the state of his foot getting these bits and pieces done so it was it was pretty full on um it was very graphic so you can look back now if you looked away for that one um yeah, for a while there, they were planning on amputating his leg below the knee. And I remember sitting in there when they brought it up and I'm trying to keep my shit together because it's not even my leg. And we'd only been together for a bit over a year mm. at that point. And 
So I'm trying to be like strong and supportive and because he's being so positive and cheery, I was like, well, shit, you can't really let down the team. And he's sitting on Pinterest, looking up all of these prosthetics that he's going to buy. Meanwhile, I'm like walking to my car and then sitting in my car and just having these like emotional breakdowns because it was so stressful. Like it was, it was really shit, to be honest. Like yeah, well, would for me. Hard, would have been harder for you. For me, it was, honestly, the accident happened. I was like six weeks in hospital, food brought to me, Netflix. Like I was like, I was less stressed about having my leg cut off than running my business, which should have told me something back then. That's true. Whereas we'd only just gotten a new puppy. So if you've seen Connie, our black and white bulldog, we'd only gotten her a week before the accident. So I was juggling like this little puppy at home. I was still working for BHB. So doing like 13 hour days and then trying to be at the hospital, spending time with him as much as I could. So look, I was on the brink. My friends were amazing through that because yeah, it was, I found it really stressful. And then I felt so guilty with how stressed out I was when I wasn't the one injured, but yeah, that was certainly, certainly something else. So we ended up getting all of the surgeries done and then yet again, doesn't like being stuck in hospital. So he pushed to be released early. So he ends up coming home a couple of days before Christmas. Was it the day before? There you go. So he came home the day before Christmas. So Christmas, we obviously didn't do anything hectic with family because we he was no we didn't <clears throat> yeah, we did. oh that was a christmas eve so you must have come home before that a yeah, couple 23rd, days before. I think. 23rd, I think. but christmas day i'd like planned to have just this little low-key christmas just the two of us so i went and got like presents and like cooked up lunch and had like christmas tablecloths and then i'd had i reckon two sips of my wine thinking like you've earned this the last few weeks and then his foot started bleeding everywhere and he's like oh we need to go back to emergency I was like put down wine and so we spent Christmas day in emergency New Year's day in emergency and then our anniversary in January back up at emergency which made me feel like maybe he was just trying to avoid (laughs) with me but yeah it was really unlucky um but look gradually healed didn't do any of the recommended rehab as usual, but you were back in the gym. I reckon it would have been within a month because you were still in your wheelchair. Yeah, I was like, well, I was crutching with the moon boot on. I, I think t- you did You did try with the wheelchair yeah. and it was shit because you didn't fit between a lot of the bits of equipment. Yeah, plus it was just embarrassing. We only over to a machine and hopping out and hopping on it. So I was just like, I'd crutch around the gym. So. Mm. But I was like, you know, I was hard because I, it had the had the lung thing and then just got just got my body back yeah and then had the foot thing so in hospital I was determined to like keep it you know I was like ah, fuck this like I'm gonna I'm gonna it's true you you know, I, I got I got the special bed change so I got one of the beds for the with, with, the, with the frame above it so I could like do chin ups and that you know which lasted for a couple of weeks until they were starving me two out of three days and I was like yeah this is not happening you know? no well you ended up losing like. 17 kilos I think around the foot in the hospital like you were a shadow when I brought you home compared yeah. to usual so oh, and then with the compartment syndrome they ended up getting they ended up having to do incisions from his knee to his ankle putting in pumps four pumps four pumps and detaching your calf from your yeah so I had this leg. old thing because when they like compartment syndrome is just swelling in, yeah. in, 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 a, in a certain But it's area. serious. Like you can it's lose your leg. Definitely. Though, like right? I could have lost my whole leg and it could have just kept going up to yeah. my groin. Oh, oh no. <laughs> but what was I saying? I think you were going to say about how loose it was. Oh, yeah. So I had like this <laughs> old man, you know, it looked like a 90 year old's calf hanging off the back of my right leg. Because all of them, like, I don't know what it is. Well, like, they just detach all, like, all the nerves and like when they kept back up the muscle because they, you know, they, they take you from your knee to your ankle and then separate your calf off so they can get in there, drain it all out and put all these pumps in to take the fluid off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I wasn't sure if the calf had ever come back, but it came back. It came back. It came back. So, yeah. it, it's, so that, that surgery was a bit over three years ago and then it sort of started off okay. 
Well, they, at, at that point, by the end of the hospital stint, then they had taken off my big toe and my first metatarsal. So this, they ended up attaching, so they ended up, so from the picture you saw before, for those that are watching where it was really open, they ended up taking a big flap from his thigh and attaching that onto his foot. So this is what it looks like with the thigh attached to the top of it with like skin grafts on the side. And the artery, and the artery they took some arteries and used those in his foot, which is absolutely incredible that they can do that. And then once it healed up, it was looking like this. So not too bad, basically just, basically just missing the big toe, still had his other toes healed up okay. But then the bones started to gradually deteriorate because there was still blood supply issues. So, yeah. so they so, became really fragile. The big toe on the first metatarsal got taken off the original surgeries. And then yeah. the next toe over, which they were thinking about taking off in the first surgery as well, but they were like, oh, it's still getting circulation to the toe and that sort of thing. So they left it there, which was great for me mentally because I only lost a big toe. Mm. Like, but then over the next three years, it just kept, and because I was, you know, I was back working full time, yeah, pushing it to the limits, the bones just, the second metatarsal and the second toe stayed all right, but the second metatarsal died back and it ended up dying back like an inch, which yeah. pulled the second toe down, which they're all linked together with tendons. So it pulled. So it's kind of like those yeah, toes that were originally pull. straight, they sort of walked all around and- And I was walking on broken bones. The bones ended up shattering in there because they got really fragile from not having the blood supplies. So then he's walking around on like, this shattered warped foot, which needless to say, would have been incredibly painful. It was definitely wasn't pleasant, but it comes, it becomes normality, like getting used to the pain. Yeah, like I didn't have painkillers for the first two and a half years. Yeah. And then we switched, like we went on the painkillers. We, 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 <laughs> we went on the painkillers. Um, went on the painkillers just to take the end, which I regret doing straight It was a bit of a slip it was definitely because that you, you take painkillers and when you start like take painkillers and they they hit the pain on the head so you're like it's great but then slowly but surely you build up a tolerance and you've got mm. to have more and more painkillers and then which is all fine but then you, you realize that the painkillers start to affect your mood start to affect your motivation start to turn off your emotions yeah so i mean you you, you saw it like the other ones the other times I came out of hospital and I was off the painkillers within three or four weeks of mm. getting home and just just pushing through whereas this time I was on the painkillers from before I went in for surgery yeah just to try to push through because my surgery got pushed back um twice yeah so that it was supposed to be earlier earlier on last year and then got pushed back and pushed back so I was just trying to bridge the gap you know so that's we ended up having another we had another surgery but we had another We're surgery a a in October last year um, where they decided to just do a full front foot amputation. So he's transmetatarsal. There you go, that technical word. So he's kept his ankle and his heel, but they've amputated all of his toes and all of those first so metatarsal. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you're comfortable. But yeah, so it's this is where we are at at the moment. Oh, yeah, Can we <laughs> So this is what your foot looks like. Oh, oh wrong foot. <laughs> yeah. So this is it now. So obviously no toes. Um, we've still got the thigh flap um, on top from the other surgery. We are going to be, we are going to be getting another one to debulk it a little bit because there is a lot of tissue in it from, because obviously it's his thigh um, and the thigh has a lot more fat cells than what your foot has. So making that a little bit smaller so that it fits in shoes a little bit easier. Yeah. But yeah, your recovery, I don't know. Like, I feel like you've done pretty well considering. It, it's like oh, the pain, because I'm off the painkillers now. So mm -hmm. it's been a long road to get off, the pain, which again, do not recommend painkillers like there's so many alternatives out there and i wish i had gone down that road and just pushed through the pain a bit more because coming off them is 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 harder than dealing with the pain every day like because you get you get anxiety when you're coming off them and 
and you, you just, again, you, you don't feel the emotions that you used to feel, you know, like you remember when we first started dating and, and I was very happy and then, and then you saw me the last year, I was just cold, you know, like yeah. just didn't want to do anything, didn't want to be anywhere, didn't want to talk to anybody, just wanted to be in my own space and yeah. just bubble up, which I 100% put down to the pain killers. So, yeah, I'm glad to be almost done with them you, know? you are definitely more like your old self now yeah like and I can feel it as well because I you know I knew I knew when I was on them I, I wasn't the same person but mm. the relief from the just just to take everything away for, for a few hours you know once you've been through this stuff for it seems like it's been like the last eight years of my life just going constantly beat down recovery beat down recovery like meningitis lung foot foot like and, and they're all just been like you just get back on top and then you just bam right that would be hard i feel like a part of you might like you're more enthusiastic maybe to the first time around but did you ever feel like seen, just fuck this shit like i've had enough oh it's like especially this last um like why me well plus it was i mean it was 2020 you know, it was a it was a it was a rough year for everybody. You know, yeah. like I've got my, I've got my own businesses too. So going through that, having my own businesses, and then trying to run them as well as deal with the pain, like everything just turned into a big bucket of shit. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. just, I just sort of just had this. Uh, you know, it's like having a, having a nice house, and then you just get home one day, you just like, oh, fuck it, you know, yeah, you're just like, oh, I'll, I'll deal with it next month. You know, yeah, you just get so beaten down and it it would be really really hard if i had to go through it by myself but you kept me sane babe i'm glad i tried you definitely you definitely you could write a book on it <laughs> oh, i don't know about that but i am i am very stubborn i am very like i'll do what i want to do oh i know when i want to do it and that's the way it is which I'm glad that those things that I do when I want to do them, they're not, you know, deal breakers <laughs> for you. You just leave, you just get a bit pissed off. But you also know I've got a good heart. You do. And I'm just going, I'm just dealing with shit my own way. So you know, what advice, if, if there's people listening that they're going through some sort of, whether it's physical, mental, whatever, rut, what advice would you give them to start taking steps to get out of it? Well, if you if you so say say you, you had one of these life changing things, right, and you're in hospital, mm -hmm. reevaluate what makes you happy, because that's what's going to keep you going. You know, I was I was lucky that I was very passionate about building and very passionate about the things I did. So while I was in hospital, I was just manifesting what was going to happen when I got out. You know. To snore, what snore? Like? If you can hear snoring in the background, that is share, share it. Sure, stop snoring. He's not going to stop. <laughs> Sub life is <laughs> still podcast about dogs one day. Oh man, the attitude cannot. Um, yeah, what was I saying? I feel like me. <laughs> but you're saying positive. So, yeah. having like, it's a really good time to just reset and, and look at your life and say, does this stuff make me happy? Does this stuff bring value to my life. Does this stuff that I'm doing make me want to get out of bed in the morning? Because if it's not something that when you wake up early and, you know, but if you like, you know, you yeah. see me for the like coming off these pain, like I'll wake up at six and then I'll still be in bed at nine. And that's hundred percent the painkillers mm. just numbing everything. But if you've got a, if you've got something there to look forward to, you know, so like hang on to things that you're passionate about. And yeah, yeah. Find your, find your goals and, and find what makes you happy and just, Pursue, pursue them, you know, and just know that there's always something that you can do better, which a lot of people just get stuck in the rut of their nine to five and then they come home and sit in front of the TV. And we live in a crazy time where there's so much opportunity and information and you can learn anything on the internet. So it doesn't yeah, matter if you're bedridden true. or whatever, you can find something there to spark an interest and give you motivation to get up and do something, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've done some crazy inventions and that sort of thing over my time yeah. which that's that's what gets me 
excited. Excited. It's yeah. coming up with something new that people will love and, and, and bring value to other people's lives, you know. That's, yeah. Whereas everybody gets caught up in the, the whole, you know, what have, I, what have I got as opposed to who have I got. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, no worries. <laughs> so what's next? Is there anything else you wanted to add? I would say drop your handles, but to be honest, he's not much of a social media no. kind of guy. There's not a lot on his um, Instagram other than photos of our dogs. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a social media recluse. He is. Um, I just like to focus on my actual life. But look, um, what is your Instagram? Tom.bill? Yeah. If it, but look, if you're into bulldogs, then you'll probably be into his gram, but that's It's, that's uh, I mean, 200 it. and something followers on big time. So. <laughs> Um, quite, they're quite the horde just after. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on and talking about it. It's not always easy to sort of talk about these sorts of things. And I'm sure people listening really appreciate you being so open. Hey, we could, we could do this again sometime. <laughs> uh, thank you for tuning in, guys. If you have any questions, drop them below and I can definitely get an answer from Tommy to you guys. Until then, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.